Today's topic is heat transfer in two dimensions, and first we'll consider the steady state case. In Fourier's heat transfer law in two dimensions, Q is now heat flux instead of heat flow rate, and it is a two-dimensional vector. In a 2D object, heat is applied through a surface. In 2D, a surface is a line and has the units of meters, and the units of heat flux, that is Q, are in watts per meter, with watts measuring the heat energy flow rate and meters measuring the surface the heat is flowing through. The x component of Q is minus K times the partial derivative of temperature with respect to x, and the y component is minus K times the partial derivative of temperature with respect to y. As in the 1D case, temperature is proportional to heat energy per unit volume, and the proportionality constant is 1 over C, where C is the heat capacity of the material in joules per unit volume degree K. Recall the 1D model for heat transfer, which is the partial derivative of temperature with respect to time equals K over C times the second partial derivative of temperature with respect to X. And if you guess that the 2D model is partial derivative of temperature with respect to time equals K over C times the second partial derivative of temperature with respect to X plus the second partial derivative of temperature with respect to Y, you'd be right. And we'll derive that in the next two slides. We want to compute the heat energy flow rate into a small rectangular control volume as shown with sides of length dx and dy centered at x and y. The center of side A has coordinates x minus dx over 2 and y, and only the x component of heat flux is passing through side A. So the heat flow rate through side A is the heat flux times the length of the side, which is Q sub x evaluated at x minus dx over 2 comma y times the length of side A, that is dy. Similarly, the heat flow rate out of the control volume through side B is Q sub x at x plus dx over 2 comma y times dy. Now let's look at sides C and D. Only the Y component of heat flux corresponds to heat flowing through sides C and D, and the heat flow rate into the control volume through side C is Q sub Y at X comma Y minus dy over two times dx, and the heat flow rate out of the control volume through side D is Q sub Y at X comma Y plus dy over two times dx. So the total heat flow rate in the control volume is given by the expression at the bottom of the page, which is the rate flowing in through side A minus the rate flowing out through side B plus the rate flowing in through side C minus the rate flowing out through side D. The first line on the slide is the heat flow rate into the control volume from the previous slide divided by the volume of the control volume, that is dx times dy. The second line results from replacing each q sub x and q sub y in line 1 with its value as determined by the Fourier heat transfer law. We can simplify line 2 to get line 3, and taking the limit of line 3 as dx and dy approach 0 gives line 4. Line 4 is the limit of the heat flow rate per unit volume at the point x comma y as dx and dy approach 0. In the steady state model, temperature is not changing and hence the heat flow rate per unit volume into every control volume, large or small, is zero, and hence the limit as the control volume shrinks is zero, and the model is, factoring out K from the result on the previous page, the second partial derivative of temperature with respect to X plus the second partial derivative of temperature with respect to Y equals zero. We've done almost all the work to derive the time-dependent model, so we'll do that as well. Temperature equals 1 over C times heat energy per unit volume. 
So the derivative of temperature with respect to time equals 1 over C times the derivative of heat energy per unit volume with respect to time. And the derivative of heat energy per unit volume with respect to time equals the heat flow rate per unit volume. So we have the time derivative of temperature equals K over C times the second partial derivative of temperature with respect to X plus the second partial derivative of temperature with respect to Y. Adding a heat source represented by the function F of T comma X comma Y with units of watts per meter squared adds F of T comma X comma Y to the heat energy flow rate per unit volume at x, y, and hence it adds 1 over c times f of t comma x comma y to the time derivative of temperature. And we have the model shown at the bottom of the page. For all the systems in this series, the 2D domain of the system will be rectangular. The temperature function, capital T, is defined for every value of time, little t, and location, x comma y, but we will only compute the values of temperature at a fixed set of grid points laid out as shown in the diagram. The coordinates of the grid points are x sub i and y sub j. For the case in the diagram, i goes from 1 to 4 and j goes from 1 to 4. The spacing between the columns is dx and the spacing between the rows is dy. In every system in this course, dx will equal dy. We'll calculate the temperatures for each grid point and store the temperatures in a 2D array, capital T, with the temperature at grid point x sub i, y sub j stored in t i comma j. Notice how the grid is laid out. It's a good idea to make a copy of this diagram to have as a reference to remind you of exactly how it is laid out whenever you're working on a 2D problem. The reason being that if you ask MATLAB to print the T array by typing T at the command prompt, something you will frequently do when debugging, the numbers won't appear laid out as they are in the diagram. There is a way to get them to appear as they do in the diagram. You must enter flip T transpose. Making the FDM substitutions in the steady state model, we have the equation in the middle of the page. And with dx equals dy, this simplifies to ti plus 1j plus ti minus 1j plus tij plus 1 plus tij minus 1 minus 4 tij equals 0. Note that the derivative substitution only works for derivatives in the interior of the grid. So for example, if we tried to use it to calculate the derivative at 1 comma 1, then t i minus 1 j would be t 0 1, and there is no t 0 1. So it doesn't work. So this equation only works for points in the interior of the grid. Let's work through an example. We start with a 3x3 three three thin plate and a 4x4 four four grid as shown in the diagram. The model gives us a linear equation for each interior point and we'll see those on the next slide. Now let's concentrate on the boundary points. We'll specify Dirichlet boundary conditions for the top and bottom rows holding the top row at a fixed temperature of 100 degrees and the bottom row at a fixed temperature of 0 degrees. We'll specify Neumann boundary conditions for the left and right sides, requiring that the spatial derivative of temperature on the sides be zero. That is, the partial derivative of temperature with respect to x will be zero on the left and right boundaries at the points indicated by the equal signs in the top diagram. The equations for the boundary points are, for the Dirichlet boundary conditions, t i comma 1 equals zero for i equals 1 to 4, sets the points on the bottom row equal to 0, and t of i comma 4 equals 100 for i equals 1 to 4, sets the temperatures at the top row to 100.
the equations for the Neumann boundary conditions are t of 1 comma j minus t of 2 comma j equals 0 for j equals 2 comma 3 for the left boundary and t of 4 comma j minus t of 3 comma j equals 0 for j equals 2 to 3 for the right boundary. The computational equation derived from the differential equation model gives us linear equations for each of the interior points and these are shown on this slide. Now we have a little problem. We have 16 grid points and 16 unknowns, the Tij representing the steady state temperatures at these grid points and 16 linear equations, which MATLAB will be happy to solve for us to determine the steady state temperatures once we have set up the 16 by 16a coefficient array and the 16 element constant column array, D. The problem is that we don't have a linear listing of these equations, that is equation 1, equation 2, equation 3, dot dot dot, all the way to equation 16. So we have to construct one and it's shown at the top of the slide. The formula is that the ijth grid point is assigned to equation number i plus j minus 1 times 4. Now we have unknown temperatures t1 through t16. The equation for the 3 comma 3 grid point is shown in its original form in the center of the page along with the variable numbers for each of the grid points appearing in the equation and the new equation T12 plus T10 plus T15 plus T7 minus 4 T11 equals 0. The 3 comma 3 grid point maps to T11, so the 11th row in the coefficient matrix has 1's in the 12th, 10th, 15th, and 7th columns and a minus 4 in the 11th column as shown at the bottom of the slide. Now let's have a look at the matrix equation. This is the matrix equation for the problem. We've seen how the interior points are represented. Grid point 3 comma 1 is on the bottom row and has a Dirichlet boundary condition. It corresponds to equation 3. The equation is T3 equals 0 and it is represented by the third row in the matrix equation with a 1 in column 3 and a 0 in the constant matrix. Grid point 1, 2 is on the left edge and has a Neumann boundary condition. It corresponds to equation 5, and the equation is T5 minus T6 equals 0. The corresponding row in the matrix equation is the fifth row, where the fifth column contains a 1, the sixth column contains a minus 1, and the constant matrix has a 0. Once the A and D matrices are set up, the solution is given by T equals the inverse of the A matrix times D. The solution is in the 1D array T, and for now we'll just list the values in order 1 to 16. We'll graph 2D temperature profiles in the next video. The assignment is to replicate the results in the video and to modify the problem so that the points on the left boundary that had Neumann boundary conditions now are held at a fixed temperature of 10 degrees. The solution is given below. Take it on it.